Is that me? <laughs> well, what do you think? <laughs> I totally love living in Hollywood. I mean, I moved here six years ago from New York. I still have not gotten over the fantasy of living in LA. And if I do, then I'll leave. Because <laughs> I totally think that that's like important. I found this place like right after I got out of graduate school and I was just totally psyched because it was on Sunset Boulevard, right in the center of the rock and roll capital of reality. You know, there was this just kind of freedom, like anything could happen. Well, there's an amp store downstairs, and um, they don't really have soundproofing. Sometimes the whole place vibrates. It's like, there we go. There's, yes, there's the amp store, like totally like perfect timing. Well, there's three kinds of green involved. A lot of times I go digging around in here because I have this pile of green and <laughs> trying to find like some kind of green that the green that'll make it all the same. But they actually um, all wind up a different green, which is interesting to me because the background in each frame, it's sort of like the wind or something. It's you know, it, this, this piece isn't finished yet, and I'm still working on it, and I have a long way to go. So what it is is it's 24 frames, 24 individual photographs of 24 individual drawings. And it's going to run, you know, like in a sort of like a, a freeze or whatever, like around the room. It's 24 frames, so it's like one second you know, it's a one second animated film. Yes, I'm 86, and I painted for 60 years. So, no, I, can, I guess I have painted for 66 years. And I'm a very fast painter. I've painted hundreds of paintings, and they're all over the world. I knew that I wanted to paint, uh, you know, not what everybody else paints. You know, this world and nature. I knew that I wanted to paint abstract. The most obvious abstract emotion is happiness. So I painted a lot of paintings about happiness. I paint about happiness, innocence, and beauty. The feelings that we have that go beyond the world, that have no worldly cause. You know, all of my work is above the line. I don't paint, I don't paint anything depressing. To live above the line, you have to think, I want to be good. I want to be good every minute. And you only pay attention to things that you like, you know. And when you go to the museum, you just look at the paintings you like. You don't look at the ones you don't like and stop and criticize and all that. People think that you, they have to understand art, but that's not right. Understanding is, you know, the mind. Contradiction and correction, and that's all below the line. 
See, when you go to the hardwood, you'll see all the paintings are about this world and the people in them and nature. Seven galleries full of them. But mine are not. You can see that's not about nature or this world. I, I really am painting out of this world. What's he building in there? What the hell is he building in there? He has subscriptions to those magazines. He never waves when he goes by. He's hiding something from the rest of us. He's all to himself. I think I know why. He took down the tire swing from the pepper tree. What's he building in there? This is, this is one I'd like to look at. You know, among uh, the interested public, you know, one out of ten gets my work. We're living in, in New Mexico, uh, about an hour north of Santa Fe, an area a lot of people have called the poorest county in the United States. But my own uh, involvement with New Mexico, I think, goes back to uh, uh, repeating dreams as a child. And, uh, that I, night after night, I would, uh, was going to sleep. I would be in this landscape with uh, telephone poles. And it was a kind of dream that would motivate you to follow it or to try to understand it. I grew up in a town called Roselle, New, New Jersey, where um, these dreams took place. No, I'm looking forward to it. The show of Bruce's opens there that's been touring around. And uh, you know, Bruce isn't going, but uh, I will be his representative. I'm just going to do it for the night, you know, a relative quickie. But I'm dying to see it. This is a new work by Richard Tuttle. It's really two boards of plywood which are cemented together and upon which he has painted. It's a very kind of quiet and restrained palette. Uh, one that almost has the feel of, of watercolor. Uh, we see a line here which exists from the shadow that this particular construction gives. So this is Some people characterize my work as, as a visual poetry. And when it comes to, well, is it painting, is it sculpture, is it drawing, is it, uh, is it big or is it small? I mean, which kind of bore me. I, I come and say that, well, you know, why can't someone just simply you know, make something? I mean, it doesn't matter if it's on paper or in, out of concrete or, or what have you. It's, it's the fact that something is made where there had been nothing before. drawing, it winds up being a cebrachrome printed directly from a transparency as opposed to a negative. With the cebrachrome, it's almost a medium, you know, in itself. So it sort of requires a pretty close collaboration with the artist. Um, I think that sometimes people don't know where to place it, you know, like, is this, I mean, certainly is this photography, you know, why is this photography, or why are these being photographed? Why do you photograph your drawings? I guess I'm thinking so much about photography and about the role of photography in the images that that gloss and that kind of distance is, is as much of a sort of an element that I'm working with as this surface. 
So I expect it. It's something that I anticipate. I've always thought of photographing the drawings as a sort of process of like incarceration, where like the drawing is kept for all eternity. This thing. This is this great um, thing from um, Sleeping Beauty, where the queen has the prince and, and shackles, and she says, "I'll let you go in 100 years." I love that. <laughs> Once I photograph and then zebrachrome, print them, then I will destroy all these drawings. And that's not something I'm looking forward to <laughs> at all. I came to New York in 1985 from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And, and the reason why I came here is to pursue a Master of Fine Arts. I graduated in 1988, and for some reason, um, I decided to stay here. Part of my reason for being in Brooklyn in the slope is I'm connected to the park. The park that I'm close to is Prospect Park. There's green here. And there is there's a lot of trees, there's, there's a lot of space. I, I never go to the park, but I know it's there. I live in the brownstone. Uh, the back space is where I sleep and where I have company and where we watch videos or whatever. And the front space is where I do my artwork. For me, living and working in the same space uh, I think I'm fortunate in that I can, I live in the back, and so I can move towards the front. I can come in and look at my work. I can sleep with my work if I want. You know, I think everybody is born to do a certain thing, and that they all study themselves, and they find out what they like and what they don't like, and find out what their abilities are and everything, and try to find out exactly what they're supposed to do. Everybody rushing so much in this life that they don't take time to really look and find out what their response is, even to their own work. Well, sometimes I paint tranquility. I have lots of paintings about tranquility. Now, it doesn't matter where you are. If you bring your mind to a stop, you will feel a light, delicate happiness. That's tranquility. You've stopped. Yeah. As I like walk around my space and I get my pastels ready and I get my charcoals ready, it's like all this stuff is going on. It's going on and it's moving me towards what I know is going to happen. And I and I sometimes I call a couple of friends who are really close to me and I say it's, it's it's coming. When I when I draw, I'm like in it. I'm like in it. so much appreciation that he stayed focused on it to find it interesting you know most people might you know give up by the second drawing or the second month you know
Me and my wife are almost computer illiterate. Almost computer illiterate. Every school kid is a computer expert now. This painting is a painting that features a little cartoon biography on King Farouk. Have you ever heard of King Farouk? King Farouk was a very wealthy playboy king from Egypt, 1938 to 1952. I wanted to do a large painting dealing with the personality that was subject to extreme self-delusion. The painting starts off with a picture of a harbor where there's no water, fictitious harbor in Cairo. It's drained of water, and yet one boat is one boat sailing away, and it's the brain of a disillusioned soul. So this is a surrealistic symbol of disillusion. See, I got all the literature I could find on King Farouk. And he was very fat, very self-centered. He uh, had a number of real colorful romances with mistresses that later made public their association with him. And one thing that seems to come from almost all the women is that he had a penis about the size of a cocktail weenie. So his sexual situations were, he was not the, the sexual athlete. He might have been the sexual aggressor, but he was certainly not the sexual athlete. The way I would describe my work is work that is done with representational art that seems to be steeped in cartoon imagery. It uh, tends to employ gratuitous sex and violence, but yet the use of gratuitous sex and violence are tools to create anxieties for the onlooker, and the reason this is done is because the painting's first responsibility is to generate energy, because the painting has to compete with television, radio, video games, computers, and, in, and a whole plethora of other stimuli. Whenever I come to Woodstock, I always feel like I just died and went to heaven. I'm totally serious about that. And I do love working up here because I just love the country. I love the landscape. I love how rough it is here. It's not, it's not real manicured, although I'm doing a good job of turning this little cat, what was once a little cabin, into quite a, quite a nice place. Oh, I'll look, at, I'll look at the flowers that I just planted. Um, this morning, I couldn't decide whether to paint or to plant. And I was really torn by that. Should I go paint, or should I stay outside and keep planting my little garden? Well, this is a, this is a summer painting. I have a lot of paintings that I call summer painting. In the summer, I, I like to play. So this is kind of playing, although I'm loving it more and more as I go. And I also like these marbles that I found in a store on 23rd Street a couple years ago. Yeah, I need to take this outside to, so I can place these marbles on it. Um. Okay. I'm going to make the marble stay down. A little bit of paint. And that'll all harden and stay there, and then I can pick it up later and take it in the studio again. This little syringe thing is um, something that a friend of mine gave me. This is something used to make um, decorate cakes with. You put icing in these. But my idea is to take this line and bring it over into here. Now this was just an idea I had of a very, very simple 
green border, a very simple pencil grid with these black lines, and suddenly I, the grid got much more complicated. And This is the way it goes, and I suppose it's that way with everything I do. The paintings don't seem to be able to hold on to that same simplicity. Here are some posters on the walls uh, from past exhibitions, and one of the first conclusions I would draw, you know, that, that I work oppositionally, uh, and it's very hard for me to use a single image. So this one of two men being uh, strangled, uh, I, I don't think one would interest me, but it's one of two men becomes kind of uh, a gesture that is recognized and known, somebody that is being strangled or we, we would want to strangle somebody. Uh, well, we're talking uh, in my studio, and it's in Santa Monica uh, on the corner of Main and Bay Street, which is about two blocks from the beach. And I've been here since about 71, 72, and it was pretty empty when I started, and as you can see, it's pretty full now. Well, this bottom poster was for a show in Stuttgart, and I'm almost embarrassed in that it's uh, so simplistic. Uh, I had this image of this very erect military academy graduate, and I liked it, you know, because of this sort of upright, good posture. Uh, for me, it just symbolized, you know, just completely any, everything in life that I don't like. <laughs> and and counterparting and in juxtaposition, you know, having these two skateboards, maybe you know, just living by the beach and having skateboarders always around me, and they seem so free and and, and so. The guy in the skateboard is actually horizontal, which is about as free as you can get, or destabilized as you can get. They're linked, but they're very different. When you have two things together, just out of curiosity, a person tries to come up with a reason for those two things being together. And when you collide images, like you collide words, you slowly construct meaning. And then the fun begins, it's like, you know, what kind of meaning are you going to construct at this block by block by block? I mean, I always think of Matisse, but who is a favorite artist of mine. His works look so incredibly simple, and like anybody could do it. And he worked very hard to get that simplicity. He talked about a work of art, putting it back on the anvil, you know, maybe a dozen times, simplifying it, simplifying it. The idea is, once you're simplifying it, that it just doesn't look simple-minded you know, that it should resonate as much as possible. It's almost, you know, a Dr. Frankenstein-like task, you know, of taking these bits and parts and trying to breathe life into it. Sometimes, in fact, you know, I do create monsters, and I wish I hadn't created them. Uh, but it's fun, you know, trying to bring dead material to life. Draftsmanship's all determined in this stage. It's to my advantage to work on sketches and get it worked out real well before I even transfer to the canvas. See? Once I get it up here, corrections are a little difficult and very frustrating. Sure. This is the finished drawing prior to being put on tissue or tracing paper to be projected. Once the thing is upon the canvas, then a whole new set of mistakes and problems arise, and it has to be corrected. And so the, the, the thing is to try to pass yourself off as someone that did something brilliantly instantly, you know. And then everyone wants to think, well, I just went to it and I immediately drew it, I immediately thought it up. But in reality, nobody can do that, you know. It's, that's what you don't tell people, is that this took a long time to come around to, and the nucleus for this idea was something that started a long time ago. This, this black, these silhouettes, are going to survive a very wild background of brisk paint. So this way I can find that image again pretty easily and put it back on top of the background.
Hey, I'm standing here at MOCA, the Museum of Contemporary Art, and there's nobody here because nobody really cares about art anymore, do they? <laughs> Every bit of art that we as a culture experience has one thing in common. At one time or another in its history, it was owned by a very wealthy person. And you see, there's a whole group of people who want to keep the physical objects that represent our culture to themselves. And they're called the art world. When I came into the art world in the mid-60s, the institutional world was full. That is, a young artist, you know, in 1962 did not aspire to have a show at the Whitney because there were five generations of young abstract expressionists lined up outside. The situation now is like that. Unless you know somebody, <laughs> you know, uh, the, the, the chance of sort of moving into that institutional culture is relatively small. I had this class at Claremont Graduate School, art theory, two years to get an MFA, Masters of Fine Arts. They're paying $40,000, 4-0. And I said, well, you know, what's your objective? And they're artists and they want to make it in the art world, right? So uh, I said, well, if I was in your shoes and all I did was make art and I wanted to make it in the art world, I would take the $40,000 and I would throw 40 parties spend $1,000 on each party, invite the right people, and you'll make it in the art world after those 40 parties, let me tell you. And they were upset. Like, I was telling them, like, hey, this is how it's done. Art, the art world exists in a social sphere, and that's where all of the deals get made. That's where all the careers get built. Who's sleeping with who? Who's friends with who? And the art you see in these public institutions, you know, has more to do with who went to school where than they do at all with the art you see on the walls. The idea that the work goes straight from the artist studio into the institution, and then the members of the board of the institution buy this work using some dealer as a fence, conflict of interest is kind of built into the system. Before I started the new museum, uh, I was the curator of painting and sculpture at the Whitney Museum. And the last exhibition that I did there was uh, a show of the work of Richard Tuttle, which was considered very controversial at the time. What was very shocking about it, I think, was the modesty of means. It upset a lot of people or shocked people, but they were people who didn't really understand them. You come in with something new and you figure, well, I've got this new thing and it'll fit right in. Well, this new thing does not fit into the near guidelines, <coughs> the near manifestos of what they've already got. People were used to very large scale work, very aggressive. And Richard's work, I mean, for instance, some of the wire pieces, which really only consisted of a nail, a piece of florist wire, and a graphite line, were so modest, so unassuming, and so impermanent that they really kind of pushed the boundaries of a definition of art. Small pieces of mine, as small as they are, they are very, very involved in, for example, the height uh, that they are from the floor. I mean, and then the precision gets down to like eighths of inches, whether these pieces work or don't work. Another one of the controversial works was a one inch uh, piece of rope that was nailed in the center to the wall. And I remember that one of the Whitney Museum trustees at that time came up to me and said, you know, I don't understand anything in this exhibition, but I have to tell you that I find that piece of rope poignant. In truth, this is what has happened. The universities are losing power. Large institutions are losing power. Writing is losing power. Uh, now, where that power will go, I have no idea. It could all really just disappear. You know, visual, high visual culture, refined visual culture could just disappear. <clears throat> this is uh, the second issue of uh, Zap Comics. Zero and number one Zap were done exclusively by Robert Crumb. Crumb was, of course, the most popular of the Zap artists. This is the first issue I had Coochie Cootie in. That's my cartoon character. So this was around 1969, 1970. And uh, as you can see, there was uh, X-rated adult subject matter in these comics. Here's Mr. Natural, Robert Crumb. 
Work, working with Zap Comics is one of the highlights of my life because I had the pleasure of working with some of the most imaginative, young, creative people I've ever dealt with. And we all um, put together an odd, surreal, abstract soup of thought and imagination. And so here's a picture of me with Gilbert Shelton and uh, Allen Ginsberg and Robert Crumb and Victor Moscoso. I received tremendous resentment for my work because in Los Angeles, as true in New York or anywhere, a society and a culture had developed that controlled itself and it policed members of its own group. And I come along with this stuff that just totally was not acceptable. And for years, I tried to police this cartoonish look out of my paintings. I tried to do very Italian-looking or Spanish-looking uh, paintings, real involved titles, and you know, I was fooling myself. So I tried to just revel in the fact that these were cartoons. And this worked. This really worked. One of the interesting things in a painting is the fact that uh, you can utilize all these uh, cartoon devices, and one of them is the thought bubble. And that's like, much like a talk bubble that uh, puts you in different mental environments. In, in a painting, I will have three or four different ways to look at the same subject matter. First, you'd have the most basic common way to do it, the most representational imagery. And then you'll have another interpretation over in the corner of it done in a cartoon uh, take of the situation, a caricature. And then somewhere else you'd have, a, have interpretations that are disturbing that you didn't see in the first picture, the, the, the larger first reading of the painting. You could see secondary readings into the situation that were uh, not what the normal person would want to see. You know, if you dig deeply into the human mind, it's going to turn out being some kind of sexual thing. And here is this guy that collects stamps. So he's, he's large in the foreground. But on the plane of reality and the world that we really exist in, he's just like a little nothing out there sitting on his stool looking at his stamp books. You know, that, that's his real position in the world. Well, right now, <laughs> for reasons I won't disclose, I'm looking for a photograph I, I have of a monkey. A lot of the photographs that are here are images uh, from crime movies. I used to go and, and find movie stills that nobody else wanted. Uh, that I could get very cheaply for about 10 cents a piece, but to be honest, all I wanted was photographs I hadn't taken, you know, that I could uh, tap into. So I, I really did want to use my own aesthetic in setting up shots. You know, just like uh, a photograph an uh, insurance agent would take of a damaged car, that would interest me because it was not taken for a beautiful photograph of a wrecked car, it was just taken as information. So those are what interest me, you know, and I try to do the art part after that. I, I collected a lot of movies of people looking at things, for instance, like this one, or people fighting, people looking down. Here you actually see some crop marks where I was going to use something, what was just the mouth showing as indicative of you know, a complete person. Only that much interested me. And on, on this one, you see what I've isolated here is just a little bit of that face and a little bit of that face, but really what interests me is that space between them and that distance. Basically, these days, the only thing you need to start a magazine is uh, PageMaker or Quark on your computer. Once you know how to use a desktop publishing thing, then it's just a matter of funding. And if you, you, know, if you want to publish a glossy, it's going to be about $40,000 an issue, and if you want to publish uh, on newsprint like I do, it's going to be about $4,000 an issue. So if you can figure out a way to raise that much money, you too can be an art world power broker. My parents really weren't supportive of me until my picture was in Time magazine. This is the uh, boxed edition of Coagula Art Journal, the first five years. What happened is I started this as a little four-pager underground newspaper for the art world. But then the art world, they kind of like it when you make fun of them. It makes them feel like, oh, look, we can take it. What do you think of Coagula Art Journal? You know, I'm not, I, I never read your stuff, not even that article that you wrote about me. So, you know, but I think that, I think that it's going places, right? When somebody who's like an art world powers that be uh, picks up a copy of Coagula, I like to see the shake in their hand, wondering if they're mentioned in it. Look, it's the secret life of Peter Halley. 
I've been at the LA Times uh, for about eight and a half years. I have no journalism background. It's strictly been on-the-job training. I had gotten interested in art uh, and wanted to spend time around art, but discovered that when you work in a museum, you spend most of your time around trustees, paperwork, fundraising, that sort of thing. One of the great things about journalism is here today, gone tomorrow. You see a show, and within 48 to 72 hours, uh, you've written it. I like that kind of pace. I also like the disposability of it. I like the fact that the, uh, you know, the, the newspaper goes out with the trash. I think that criticism is essentially a conversation, and what I'm interested in is participating in the conversation. I, I would say that I was an art critic, except nobody really practices art criticism anymore. Art criticism sort of presumes that there's, a, there's sort of a turbulent discourse in public about what works of art that we like. And uh, this doesn't really go on anymore in any lively way. You know, the art world is basically run like a little league franchise now where every little kid gets to play, you know, and so we don't really pass judgments anymore. So since we don't pass judgments, I'm not really, a, a, you know, an art critic. I did a little piece on Bob Rauschenberg for Art Forum. Well, that was fine, and then there was Tom Crow on Rauschenberg, and then there was uh, Dory Ashton on Rauschenberg. If I write a piece like that, it is always accompanied by from two to five contrary opinions, you know. You never get to just say, hey, I think this is cool, and then have an editor say, hey, I believe in this critic, and, you know, I'm going to stand behind what he says. Well, I want to stand behind... Uh, a rainbow coalition of voices. The newspaper has almost no art world advertising, which is what compromises most art magazines. They have to protect their uh, fiscal base, and that gives a critic writing for a newspaper a kind of freedom and independence that a writer in a magazine that is beholden for its very operation simply doesn't have. Robert Williams had the idea for the magazine, and he sort of established from the beginning maybe a style of artists that we're looking for. Juxtapose is an art magazine for people who have a runaway imagination and a tremendous talent to back up that imagination and no place to go with these two products. Word of mouth was what sold the mag. From that alone, the magazine sprouted up quickly. We get tons of submissions, people who have no training, people who are amazing artists looking for an outlet. We went to press with this quarterly, and that was four years ago, and it's one of the top-selling art magazines on the newsstand now. Very often people think, oh, well, critics have great fun, you know, slashing and burning things that they hate. Maybe other people do. For me, it's extremely difficult to do. It's, it's harder to write about art that you don't like. Here's a sample. This is a book review on the life of Clement Greenberg. This is a deeply depressing book Misanthrope, drunk, drug addict, cultist, artist abuser, and all around shit, Clement Greenberg doesn't even come off as the worst person in his own biography. I've been beat up in a gallery before, punched out in an opening. I've had drinks thrown in my face. You know, artists, you give them a bad review, and they really react. You know, I think that I was, in some sense, prepared for this work to be seen as controversial, but I was unprepared for the vehemence it was almost as though um, a religious belief had been attacked. In terms of deciding what to write about, it's anybody's guess. You know, it depends uh, on any given week. There are 10 shows you want to cram into X amount of space. You have a decision to make. And if another week there are only two shows, well, those shows have much greater odds of being covered. I was actually asked to resign just after the Tuttle show. And the truth is that it's certainly the best thing that ever happened to me. That really provided the incentive for creating the new museum. Walk till you're restless, sleep till you're tired. Wake up without thinking You're the one that I desire
these are, are two books that are uh, about the same size, it turns out. Uh, what, uh, this one was made in Italy and this one was made in America. Uh, both uh, seem very concerned with the, the physical quality of looking at a book. In this one, you have uh, what was originally an announcement card for an exhibition and it was at the Galleria Alessandro Bonomo in Rome, and I had this idea to take all of the pieces from the show and uh, extend them out from the what had been the announcement card. Uh, I knew this was a, a great challenge for the printer. Uh, one, uh, because of the problems of uh, doing such a specific color on the cover, and then two, printing on a vellum like this, and it's in fact a, a masterpiece of uh, contemporary printing. And this one, uh, each page has a group of intersecting lines uh, which were then cut with a sharp knife. It's very beautiful here, the shadow that comes down across the page. My particular interest in trying to bring more space to the page than it, it's normal is going on in this. I listen to a lot of music. I learn from music. I love opera. There's nothing that makes me happier than having a great opera on Saturday afternoon at the opera and being in my studio, not having any responsibilities and just being able to paint all afternoon listening to the opera. Um, I like that much better than going to the opera where I become bored and restless and I'd much rather listen to it and paint. We'll see what the future holds for a person like me. You know, you, you got to have a certain personality and you just can't, the average person can't be doing this. They got to be out, and they got to be around, they got to be commuting on the freeway, whatnot. But uh, this is this is almost a monastic life, you know. It's, I mean, you, you got to really be into this to do it. But I have made hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars out of this little living room painting these paintings. And, and um, gee, I don't see any change coming real fast. One of the great things out here is that being able to see these distances. I certainly in Manhattan couldn't say, you know, look, look over, you know, go over there. That's, you know, that's where there's a nice motel uh, for the night. But here you can look out and uh, you can see where you'll be three hours of driving later. Well, good evening, my yeah, I had a nice hours. time. Uh, so I got bitten by something in, in uh, New Mexico. I don't know if it was a, um, a spider or an ant. I don't know, but I came back with these big red marks. <laughs> and my cousin, who's a doctor, said, I just stay out of the country. <laughs> I'm a city girl. <laughs> we have a lot of uh, uh, insects and things that uh, can, will ki can kill you <laughs> around here. I'm just seeing a harmless a uh, bug in the in the door there, which I thought you know might be a black widow spider or uh, <laughs> a centipede or other number of things that you don't want to have around. New Mexico is a very tough place. Uh, the few things that can live here uh, have to be extremely tough, and that includes human beings. That you, uh, if you want to live here for a long time, you have to find something very strong, or the, even the strongest thing that you have inside of yourself, and bring it out and put it right in front of this uh, enormous, powerful nature, you know, that's here. And I, maybe that's one reason uh, artists like it, too, because in a way that's what you're doing in your artwork anyway. This was a piece that went on year after year in the corner of my studio without uh, being solved. Um, I'm going right down to the last possible moment and saying, well, maybe this is just junk. Maybe this is nothing, because it certainly looks like junk, and I'm sure most people who are watching right now think it's a piece of junk. Uh, and 
And I'm willing to say it's a piece of junk and throw it out, but there's something, you know, where you ask yourself, well, why, you know, can't you just discard this? Why isn't it nothing? We started collecting 30. 62, that's over 30 years ago. Over 30 years ago, Dorothy and I started collecting, and they were all over our apartment, on the floor, almost on the ceiling, and there were pieces on the ceiling. If we can afford it, we'll keep, buy it, and if we can't, well... That's too bad for us. But I don't want to go into finances and art. I mean, I want to stay away from everybody else is doing it. L luckily, that's, that's true. Otherwise, he'd be buying Rembrandts and uh, Vermeers <laughs> and so on. Yeah. So on. That's right. <laughs> this piece has such a dynamic uh, power that um, it, has, it doesn't has ne necessarily have to have one content or one characteristic. It, it can have a few or money. When he put it up, all of a sudden, it was like a punch in the wall. The room came alive, and I, d I saw it as a dynamite. I didn't see it as serenity. It really brought up the wall. The whole room became alive. Hi, Bob. Here to pick up the car. All right, and it's all ready to go. This is how they tried to shim the back of that. Uh, oh, man. Yeah, and that's what broke off, and that's what started the whole problem. When I was young and lived in the South, my father had a fleet of stock cars that ran the circuits down south and NASCAR and so forth. So uh, I'd always been around motorcycle races and stock car races, and at a very early age, I developed an appreciation for uh, old automobiles with souped-up engines. And uh, when I was uh, 13 years old, my father bought me a 34 Ford 500 Coupe, which I drove on back roads. This particular car has got a grace and uh, elegance to it. You don't find in modern cars. I don't really care for modern cars. It's a 1934 Ford two-door sedan, and it's been chopped four inches. I uh, designed the interior, which is pretty um, traditional hot rod interior, except for the headliner, which I designed myself and drew the pattern. Gee, you're doing a great job. Have we done that part? So I, like many, many artists, the traditional thing in the portfolio under the arm, going door to door, I went to the unemployment agency and they found me a job as art director for Ed Big Daddy Roth, the, the car customizer. Now, Ed Big Daddy Roth, I met him in 1960 at a car show in Albuquerque, and he was a childhood hero of mine. <clears throat> he was a big, tall beatnik that built hot rods. This is one of Ed Big Daddy Roth's uh, car show trophies turned upside down. When I worked at Roth, so you give my wife a trophy. And how I landed this job, I don't know. He took one look at my portfolio, and he says, look, if I knew you existed, I'd have hunted you up. So from that moment on, my life changed. Well, the dots over their faces are really because their faces don't matter. You know, it's the, it's the uniform and the posture. Well, this is kind of telling because these are from years and years ago. The face is all obliterated except for this one guy's face showing. I wanted them to be, I was color coding people, you know, that the red person might be dangerous or the green person might be safe or what have you. And I use this idea of locking out faces. It, it, where it came from uh, was years and years ago teaching a life drawing class, trying to get students to look at the body totally instead of spending so much time drawing the face. So I would block out the model's face by just putting a drape over it. Their faces don't matter, you know, and I'm trying to call attention to that. If I didn't obscure the faces, then you would get wrapped up in, you know, how they looked. When I was a, 
a little boy. I was waiting for my older brother to come home from school. And I went out on to the porch where I hoped I could see him uh, coming down the street. Uh, but instead, I looked out and I saw that everything was, was perfect. Every color, every blade of grass, every molecule. And I was so totally, totally thrilled. And you know, I, I could put together that experience with listening to Mozart and the, the absolute you know, flawless perfection of a, of a line written by, by Mozart that kind of perfection. And so I know that Mozart must have had that experience. You know? I mean, for example, in the, the, the wire pieces, you know, or the thin wire pieces, uh, I mean, I'm just trying to make exactly that experience, you know, for somebody else. I, I would much rather be in my studio painting than preparing for a show. When, when you have a show, it's like someone threw a stick in the spoke of your bicycle. The studio kind of closes down and you have to start doing business. And you do that for a couple months. I mean, that goes on for months. It does, it's not like it stops the minute the show is over. And it's always hard to get back in the studio. Oh, hi. Hi. Amy Adler. Nice to meet you. Your name rings a bell. Does it? Yeah. How would I know your name? I'm an artist. I don't know. Yeah? Where do you show? Ah, okay, okay. Woo Look, the Art World establishment has joined us. Oh. You're gonna have a show at MoCA? I am. Yeah? <laughs> now that's the establishment. So would you put your art in a neo-conceptual postmodern text context? <laughs> oh, I almost had it. <laughs> I should run. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. So where should we meet you? Sitting by the pool. Okay. Okay, excellent. Okay. Bye. You know, if we don't talk on the phone every day, something's wrong. Something's wrong. <laughs> we actually we talk we talk pretty regularly. Well, Amy, Absolutely. as you know, has the big show with uh, Mocha in the fall. I'm gonna walk by Mocha, and there's gonna be a flag, <laughs> and it's gonna have her name on it. So that's it doesn't get any better. That's that's the reason for doing this. difficult thing is to find your vision. For 20 years, I knew that I had not hit upon my vision. For 20 years, I did not show them and I did not sell them. I burned them. It took me 20 years to get free. <laughs> This is Jackson Pollock, and there's no art around, and there's no viewer, and there's no relationship between the object and the viewer. There's just the artist, because in the end, that's all it's about is the artist. This painting here um, is Picasso-esque in the respect that it's about a minotaur. 
The primary character in here is an effeminate minotaur that's an aspiring ballerina. And the poor ballerina has to come to the realization that she's just not very good. So I've got a bucolic scene in the forest here with the ballerina laying down by the stream crying in remorse and she's with her retainers and of course her retainers are pointing out to the fact that uh, her, her uh, desperation and sadness is uh, magnified by a cloud formation of an abstraction of herself so that she can be portrayed on a, a grander scale in the clouds. Quite a guy, quite a guy. You don't have to listen to anybody about anything. Whatever you want, you get.